I'll stand up as we get ready to worship the Lord. <clears throat> and let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, thank you so much for getting us here today, Lord. And God, we want to worship you and praise you and uh, just spend this time with you, Lord, to hear from you, to bless you for your blessings to be on us, Lord. I'm moved by your spirit today, in Jesus' name, amen.
You can be seated.
be each and every one of our prayer that we would surrender to you this morning take over take over this place take over our hearts take over with your word pierce us by your word this morning change us take over me in jesus name amen the ushers will come forward we'll receive this morning's tithes and offerings do you you can do that. We're missing some people today, so. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, a few announcements that we want to make sure we did. One is the men's retreat is October 18th. Um, and guys, I mean, the women had the retreat a, a while back, and it was a wonderful experience. So I encourage all of you. If you can make it, to make it, um, it's a great time of fellowship, and um, I'm sure the teaching will be wonderful. Um, Harvest Carnival. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, thank you for the tithe and offering, um, for the opportunity, Lord, to buy up every everything that you have before us um, to further your gospel. 
It is our privilege to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. The other thing is the Harvest Carnival. Now, the Harvest Carnival, we kind of, we decided to have it. It was kind of questionable because we're kind of a little bit behind on it. However, we can pull it together because we've done it before. So I encourage all of you, if you can participate, to participate. We need candy. We need people to run the booths, set up and tear down. Um, it's, it's a long night, but it's well worth it. Um, we have a lot of the kids come through and it keeps them off the streets. There's some pretty scary stuff going on out there these days. Um, so it, it's where I am, I am not a Halloween fan. And all of you who know me know that about me. But I have been able to attend those things because it's such a wonderful alternative. And um, so I, it's an outreach that we are proud of. It's an outreach that we give back to our community. What our mark is, we have a lot of candy and we give them a lot of candy and stuff. So we have the kids that just keep circling, going back and forth and back and forth because they come out with bagfuls. So, um, so that is our trademark. Give all those little children candy. Nothing scary, just things that will rot their teeth. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, like the shopping bags and stuff so that they can gather candy. But um, we do need people to sign up. I don't know if it's in the back yet, but there will be. We do need people to run the booths. And um, we have, we're not going to add games, but we have plenty of games and stuff. And we do transform the upstairs and downstairs. Um, I believe we'll be having popcorn, right, and some drinks. So I encourage all of you, if you have never been, to join us and help us out and um, enjoy the evening of fellowship. I think that's it. Okay, everybody can stand up and say hi to each other. And children, you are dismissed. Father, thank you for um, this time together. Thank you as we gather in your name. There you are in the midst of us. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for your word this morning. As we get ready to look in again, we ask that you teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the Gospel of Mark, and I don't have the PowerPoint this morning because I forgot to upload it. So uh, we're going to improvise and, and um, <clears throat> work through it that way. So A Servant's Heart is the series that we're in in the Gospel of Mark. And last time our message was the baptism of Jesus. If you remember that from last week, we studied verses 9 through 15. Why was Jesus baptized? To demonstrate his forgiveness so we could be filled with the Spirit as he was and to identify himself with sinners. And today's message is Fishers of Men as we study verses 16 through 20 and continue to work through chapter 1. It's a pretty long chapter, so we're taking it in sections. Uh, Probably one of the most famous sayings of Jesus is, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. But was that just for a small group of guys way back when? Or is that for us today? And of course, it's for us today. So we're going to read Mark 1, 16 through 20. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So how do we become fishers of men? Number one in your outlines is go where the fish are. Go where the fish are. And verse 16 again says, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So if we go to the graphic, the picture, uh, the first picture there, Jay, he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, uh, which probably was around Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he sees these fishermen, uh, Simon and Andrew, his brother. And this lake goes by several names in the Bible. It goes by the Sea of Chinnereth, or the Lake of Gennesaret, 
or the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, which was the most popular uh, of all of them. And we can go to the next slide. And it's a harp-shaped um, sea, if you will, but it's not really a sea, obviously. It's a lake. It is the second lowest lake in the world, elevation-wise. It is the lowest freshwater lake. The Dead Sea is the lowest one, but the Sea of Galilee is next. And it sits at, no, you can stay on that, uh, on, on that slide. It sits at 685 feet below sea level. The Dead Sea is 1,410 feet below sea level. So that's quite a valley there. Uh, and it goes from uh, Mount Hermon, which feeds the Sea of Galilee, and then all the way down to uh, the Dead Sea, uh, so it's, it's quite an incline going down. Uh, it's the largest supply of fresh uh, drinking water in Israel. It supplied all of Palestine with fish. It's the largest freshwater lake in Israel. It's 64 square miles with an average depth of 84 feet up to 141 feet. It's 13 miles long and about 7 miles wide. And up to seven of the 12 apostles were fishermen on this lake. In fact, Josephus claims in his day he was a Jewish historian who was just a little bit later than this time. Uh, he said that there, on any given day there were 330 fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. So people ate a lot of fish. It was their main meat source. So these fishermen, Simon and Andrew, were where the fish were at. In other words, they, they, didn't, they didn't fish in the Dead Sea. They wouldn't have caught anything there. And my point with that is this. Many Christians isolate themselves so that they're never in touch with the world around them. And they'll only deal with Christian companies. They'll only deal with Christian friends. They won't deal with anything or anyone non-Christian. And don't misunderstand me. Fellowship with Christians is important. Supporting Christian companies is important, but how can we be fishers of men if we're not in touch with the fish? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He said, you are the light of the world. People don't take a lamp and put it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand so that it lights up the room. And so how can we be fishers of men if we're not in touch with the fish? So Jesus sees Simon and Andrew casting a net into the sea. Simon, of course, becomes Peter. And Mark contains more references to Peter in, in proportion of the length of his gospel than any of the other gospels, showing us that Peter was probably the source of the gospel of Mark. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus had met Simon and Andrew. He met them earlier, but here he's calling them to discipleship. There were actually three separate calls uh, that Jesus did this process of calling the disciples. And the first one is in John 1, 35. And we can go to that, J, yeah. And it says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. A lot of Johns in the Bible. John stood with the two, two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Cephas is the Aramaic word 
Petros is the Greek word where Peter comes from, and it means a little stone or a rolling stone. And so Peter gets renamed right in the beginning, right when he, he meets Jesus. So that was the first call. The second call is here in Mark chapter 1, where he declares that he would make them fishers of men. But the final call will be over in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. And then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Verse 16, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the names Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simeon, the Canaanite, <clears throat> verse 19, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into the house. So this was a process of calling them. Mark here in chapter 1 is just emphasizing and interested in the fact that when Jesus called them, they answered the call. But there was probably up to a full year from the time they saw or met Jesus until this point in Mark chapter 1. Jeff Thomas uh, says this, They had a whole year to hear and observe Jesus, to question him and mull, mull over his answers. They had heard his preaching to the crowds. So when Jesus came to them at the side of the Galilean lake and invited them to follow him, it was not a leap into the dark as far as they were concerned. They had thought about him for 12 months. In fact, there was scarcely anything else they had talked about, this extraordinary Jesus from Nazareth. So his invitation to them to follow him was preceded by observation, information, knowledge, and a heavenly revelation that he had given to them. So before you appeal to people's wills to make a decision to accept free salvation in Christ, they must be given knowledge of who Jesus is and why he's worthy of their trust. That was Jesus' own approach. Friendship and example and teaching preceded the command to follow him. So becoming fishers of men would not be an immediate transformation with but would be a gradual process over time. And this is where the church comes in as well, folks, because inviting people to church is a great way to be fishers of men because they're, they're coming in and they're being exposed to the gospel over time and hopefully their questions will be answered as they get to see and know Jesus more and more. Someone said, faith in Christ is not just a single step. It is a lifelong walk with him. Amen. So we have to be where the fish are. Secondly, to become fishers of men, we need to use the right equipment. That's number two in your outlines. Use the right equipment. Verse 16 again. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. So not only do we have to be where the fish are, we have to actually be using the right equipment. And casting there literally means to, to throw around. Uh, you can see the word balo at the end. Well, you can't there because I don't have my PowerPoint. Uh, but balo is at the end of that Greek word, and balo is where we get the word ball from. And it means to throw. That's what the word originally meant. So casting literally means to throw around, because that's what they would do with these nets. They were round nets with weights on them, and they would throw them into the water like that, and then they would sink, and as they sunk, they would pull the rope, and it would close off, and it would capture the fish inside of the net. It's interesting, though, that Jesus called them to be fishers of men and not shepherds of sheep. God bless you. Later, Jesus will say to Peter, feed my sheep. But here he calls them to be fishers of men. And it's appropriate because 
They were fishermen. Exactly. And he's calling them in. And casting their nets the way they did back then. They didn't throw a line and bait into the water. They threw these nets in the water. And catching fish that way was indiscriminate. So you didn't go for a certain kind of fish. You went for any fish you could possibly get and catch in the net. It doesn't focus on one type. And that's the perfect picture of the net of the gospel and following Jesus. C.H. Spurgeon said, The gospel minister is like the fisherman with a net. I have sometimes heard the comparison drawn as though the gospel fisherman had a hook and a line, which he has not. His business is not to entice a fish to swallow his bait, but to cast the net all around him and lift him by his grace out of the element in which he lies in sin, into the boat where Christ still sits as he sat in the olden days in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. To shut the sinner up to faith in Jesus Christ, that is the main work of the true gospel fisherman. And the, the way we do that, guys, is by following Jesus. Following Jesus. Following Jesus. It, it's really about knowing Jesus intimately. It's about following him intimately. And if you know Jesus intimately, he will enable you to be fishers of men. It's not something you do. It's something that he will make you become. That's what he said. Jesus wants you to know him, he wants you to follow him, and he wants you to have that deep relationship with him. So he said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. He didn't say, do this work for me. He said, follow me, and I will make you. And this is an idea that actually comes from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 16, verse 16. It says, behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them, and afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. But there in Jeremiah, he's talking about judgment. Fishermen fishing for judgment. So, but Jesus here is using it to, uh, to say, I'm going to free you from judgment. I'm going to deliver you from that judgment and escape that judgment. So Jesus sees them fishing and casting out their nets and says, you can do that with people too. There were times when they fished all night and caught nothing. And there were other times when they couldn't haul in the fish. There were so many. I mean, you know, I grew up fishing. I grew up uh, around saltwater fishing. So fishing in the bays and fishing in the ocean. And uh, we, when I was a kid, we used to go fishing in the summer times every single day. Sometimes we'd catch in a whole lot of fish. Other times, not even a nibble, nothing, you know. But the point is, just be faithful with the task of casting out your nets and using the right equipment, which is following Jesus, and the order is very important, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That's the order. Follow me, and then you'll become fishers of men. It reminds me of the seven sons of Siva. And I love this story. It's in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19, verse 13. I think I have it, yeah. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, now notice this, they're Jewish exorcists, they're not believers. They're Jewish exorcists, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus. They're not believers. So they took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. I guess it wasn't working for them the other way. So they thought, oh, let's try this. And saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Do you see that? They don't know him. It's the Jesus whom Paul preaches. 
Verse 14, also there were seven sons of Siva, Jewish chief priests, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I think it's a humorous story. This is, it's a classic example of fishing with the wrong equipment. They weren't followers of Jesus. They, they saw Jesus as, well, maybe some kind of a magic formula that we can use. And notice the evil spirit knew who Jesus was and knew who Paul was, but not the seven sons of Siva. And so following Jesus wholeheartedly is the key in being fishers of men. We have to know Jesus, and it has to be real. Again, uh, Je Jeffrey Thomas says this, It's been well said that discipleship is more than getting to know what the teacher knows. Discipleship is getting to be what the teacher is. And before Christ equips and sends out his disciples to be man fishers, he equips them first with the image of himself. By their fellowship with him, by their union with him, by their attendance to his word, by their reliance on his grace, he causes them to be like him. Sanctification is the first training ground for evangelism. We are not ready to do the work of evangelism until we have begun to make progress in sanctification. Because holiness of life is the first witness of the truth and power of the grace of the gospel. So verse 19. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. So now we get introduced to James and his brother John, who were also known as the sons of thunder. And it's ironic that John was a son of thunder, because he later becomes the disciple of love, and the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, we're going to find out from Luke's gospel that James and John were partners with Simon and Andrew. So these first four were partners together in the fishing business, along with Zebedee, uh, James and John's uh, father. And so they're in the boat mending their nets. And the Greek word for mending is the same word in Ephesians 4, where Paul says to pastors and teachers to equip the saints for works of service. The word equip is this same word, mending. And that's what it means. It means to equip or to mend. And so just as James and John were equipping their nets, getting them ready when Jesus called them, so this would be the work that they would be doing as fishers of men. They would do this as teachers, equipping the saints with the word of God. Uh, Ray Stedman says, this is a beautiful thought because it indicates that when our Lord calls us, he not only equips us, taking full responsibility to teach us everything we need to learn in order to fulfill that calling, but he does it in such a way as to retain those nuances of personality that mark us as us. So they're mending their nets. They took the time that was necessary to prepare their nets for casting out and catching the fish. And spiritually, I see this as the preparation that comes from the Word of God. So as following Jesus is part of the right of equipment, so is his Word. And they go hand in hand. In fact, you can't follow Jesus without his Word. And sometimes our nets, as we're throwing out to catch the fish, sometimes they get snagged on rocks and they get ripped a little bit. And we have to go back and we have to go back to the Word and back to Jesus' feet and sit at his feet and hear from him. And our nets are mended through that process. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word 
With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commands. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then verse 28 of that same psalm. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Ever feel like your, your soul is just melting with heaviness? Go back to his word. And verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. And every verse is about the word of God. You think it's important? You think God's word is important? Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So God's word is our preparation to equip the saints or to mend the nets, if you will. And again, this is why we place such a high emphasis on the teaching of the word of God here at Warehouse. Well, I wanted to show you a couple of graphics here, but I don't have them, so I apologize for that. But I was gonna show you a, a boat that archeology span has actually found and they have actually nicknamed it the Jesus boat because it dates back to the time of Jesus and these fishermen. And, uh, and so that's on display. And then they have a reproduction of that boat as well. So, but sorry about that. You can watch the YouTube video and I'll, hopefully I'll have these graphics uh, on that instead. Number three, be willing to sacrifice. Be willing to sacrifice. So go where the fish are. Use the right equipment, but also be willing to sacrifice. Mark 1.20. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. There's that word immediately again. Immediately he called them. And the word called there is not, it's not immediately he called them as this is their calling. It's immediately he called them called them by name, and he yelled out their names. They're on the boat, remember, mending their nets. So the boat could have been out from the shore a little bit, and he called to them, and immediately they, uh, they uh, um, left the boat uh, and left their father with the hired hands, and they went after Jesus. Now, any fisherman will tell you that if you want to catch fish, you have to be willing to sacrifice. And you have to be willing uh, to be patient. Fishing requires a tremendous amount of time and patience. And sometimes you catch a lot of fish, and other times you don't even get a nibble. But James and John left their father in the boat with the other employees and went after Jesus. So Zebedee apparently had a thriving fishing business. And they had hired servants, so it was doing fairly well. And so James and John were probably a little bit spoiled. Jesus did call them the sons of thunder because they had those personalities, you know. And so James and John left their father. They left the boat. They would have been leaving a lot probably. Uh, John apparently had business contacts to regularly sell fish to the priestly families in Jerusalem because in John's gospel, it tells us that he was known by the chief priests. So they knew John the Apostle, all the leaders in Israel. Luke tells us this in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat, 
And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. Verse 10, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And by implication, Andrew. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So they left their father Zebedee and they forsook all and followed Jesus. Following Jesus is costly and sometimes even involves severing family ties. I know for me, when I became a Christian, there were multiple sev severs in my life. Not, not because I wanted that. I didn't want it, but it was just a natural result from following Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus' point was, don't go looking for fights. That's, that's not what he was saying. But rather, when we follow Jesus closely, there will be divisions that take place. Uh, as Jesus was not accepted in his own town, his hometown. And he couldn't do very many miracles there because of their unbelief. They could, just couldn't get how this son of the carpenter could do these things, you know. And even his own half-brothers rejected him at first and didn't believe him. Now, in early Jewish writings, the description of a follower of a rabbi was one uh, uh, was that he was to cover himself in the dust of the rabbi's feet. That's how followers of rabbis talked about themselves. They were to cover them, their feet and themselves in the dust of the rabbi's feet. And the idea is they walk so closely behind the rabbi that they get his dust that he kicks up from his feet. And this is how Jesus wants us to follow him, guys. Only he doesn't kick up dust. He kicks up righteousness. And in this case, with James and John, it seems that Zebedee was supportive of their move to follow Jesus, so they were fortunate that way. But that doesn't always happen. And this also doesn't mean that in order to follow Jesus, we need to quit our jobs. We're not all called to leave our jobs in order to follow Jesus. We are all called to follow Jesus in our jobs. We're not all called to quit our businesses to follow Jesus. We are all called to follow Jesus in our businesses. And so whatever we're doing, we do it for the Lord. Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, not everyone will do this. 
Not everyone will follow Jesus. Not everyone who, Je- who Jesus said to follow him did it. There were some who Jesus called and they hesitated. Like over in Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, count the cost. Count the cost. The Son of Man has no way. Are you going to follow me? See, he knew the man's heart. Verse 59. And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. What he's saying is, let me go and wait for my father to die, and then I'll, I'll follow you at that point in time. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow, strong words there. And he, what, Jesus wasn't being heartless, but he knew people's hearts. And he knows people's hearts. And he knows the excuses were just that. Excuses. In order to not follow him. Benjamin Franklin once said, He that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. And there's an American proverb that says, Excuses are merely nails used to build a house of failure. I like that one. Excuses are merely nails that are used to build a house of failure. So being fishers of men means to go where the fish are, to use the right equipment, follow Jesus, stay close to his word, mend the nets with the word of God, and be willing to sacrifice. Be willing to follow him. Be willing to do what he wants us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today, Lord. And Lord, we don't want to make any excuses. But we confess we do. Lord, I pray everyone here, Lord, would just make that commitment to you in the spirit to follow you. To follow you wholeheartedly. That in whatever we're doing, in with whoever we're with, or, or wherever we're at, that it's all about following you and doing your work. Whether it's in our jobs, in our schools, uh, with our neighbors, whatever, wherever, at the grocery store. <laughs> May we always look to follow you. And may we stick so closely to you, Lord, that you just kick up your righteousness on us. And that bleeds over to everyone around us. So God, be with us this week, Lord. Guide us, direct us by your spirit. And Lord, as we follow you closely, as you promised, make us become fishers of men. In Jesus' name, amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Oh, 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 oh. All your ways are good.
you go.